Hebrews chapter 3. If you found that, why don't you stand? We'll read together God's Word. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 3, we're going to start in verse 1 and read down to verse 6. Grass withers and the flowers fade, but the Word of our God stands forever. Let's begin right there, verse 1. <clears throat> Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession, who was faithful to him who appointed him, just as Moses also was faithful in all of God's house. For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were to be spoken later, but Christ is faithful over God's house as a son, and we are his house, if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope. Join me as we pray. <clears throat> Father, thank you for the testimony that Zach made today, giving credence to his conversion. Thank you for changing his life. We pray you would use him for your glory. For every man and woman here that have gone to the waters of baptism, after professing Christ and, and pledging and loving Christ. Father, there, there are men and women that walked into this worship service tired from life. Father, I need you to do what I cannot do. Would you make it so that what I say today comes directly. Lord, guard my, my mouth so that so that the words come directly from the Bible, honor you, and are good for your people. Lord, help, help us today, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> just as tears, real tears, when you cry, just as tears in your eyes blur your vision, Literally, you can't see, just as tears in your eyes blur your vision, trouble in your world makes it hard to see joy. To actually and genuinely be joyful. It doesn't take much. It doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be a lot of trouble. I mean, you think about a, a, lost, a lost pet. A dog that you love dies, or a sick kid, a wayward friend, a failed job. Every one of those things that I just mentioned happened to steal, takes joy away. When the car breaks down and the kids don't do right, steals joy. Or, or it could be, I mean, it could be that the problem it could be that the problem is your own making, or at least it's in your own head. Sometimes we can't get out of our own head. We just can't stop thinking about it. Could be that you're unreasonably anxious, or it might even be that, that you're unthoughtfully falling over into sin. You could be unthoughtfully sinful. I mean, truthfully, so much of our own pain is Self-inflicted. So much of our own pain is self-inflicted and sometimes undiagnosed sin. Sin does all kinds of things. Sin, sin makes us afraid. Sin makes us defensive. Sin can make us hard. Sin can make us sad. Sin can make it so that every mountain seems unclimbable and every problem seems unsolvable. And it ends up mudding our minds and so we can't think, or at least, <clears throat> at least we don't think clearly. 
And, and all of that brings us here. You see, this passage right here is written by a pastor to a group of people that are panicked. It's a group of Christians that gets it for the first time and they feel like their world, we don't know exactly what's going on, but they feel like their world is falling apart. So here's what the preacher does in chapter 1. He, he establishes the deity of Christ. It's all chapter 1 speaks of Jesus Christ as fully God. He gets that peg in the ground and he turns his attention in chapter 2 and then tells us that Jesus is fully man. That's what chapter 2 is. And then after having established really sound doctrine on who Christ is, now in chapter 3, the preacher pauses. <clears throat> He wants to collect their hearts and their minds so that they might think clearly. We, we've got to think clearly. And I just want to spend the, the few moments we have together using this passage to help us. Look, I, I actually know what some of you are dealing with. Today we need to think clearly. Because when we think clearly... We actually live joyfully. And I work backwards from that statement. I want you to live joyfully. And if that's going to happen, we have to think clearly. How do we do that? Well, let's go where the Bible takes us. And let's start with the foundation. Here's the first thing. Number one, we need to think clearly about Jesus. What we have to do here, this is a Christian organization, a Christian gathering, a body of Christ, and an actual family so if you're here as a visitor or your guest, you should know you're, you're seeing and witnessing what Christians do on Sunday. But why do we do that? Well, the driving point right here in the passage starts in verse 1. And you'll see it there as the preacher tells us about Christ. Let's read it. Verse 1. Therefore, holy brothers, we'll come back to that. Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heaven, heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession. There's a danger. Let's pause there. There's a danger that many people that call themselves Christians fall into. There's a danger that, that many churches get on a road that travels in a, in a wrong direction. And that is thinking about Jesus in a way that accommodates us and doesn't glorify Him. It's very easy, very seldom will people reject out of hand Jesus. They just want a different kind of Jesus. And we're told in the Bible, we, we have, we are presented. Our obligation as Christians is to actually receive the Jesus that the Bible presents to us. Not, not, as, not as the world wants him, but as the Bible presents him. I mean, the danger that this church right here, this is, remember, this is written to a church, the danger that the church here in the text, they were facing a very specific danger, and their danger was considering Jesus in light of Moses. Remember, they're Jewish Christians, and the threat is to fall back into Judaism, and the point that this preacher is making is you need to not consider Jesus in light of Moses, you need to consider Moses in light of Jesus. In fact, you can take that principle if you'd like, just pull it up and say, that whatever, whatever you're dealing with, your problem, what happens is we oftentimes view Jesus through the lens of our problem, hoping he'll solve the problem. When we, when we should turn that around, we actually need to be looking at our problems through the lens of Jesus. We, we look at life situation, our worldview becomes look right through Christ. Why? Because according to what this preacher says, Jesus Christ, is the, Jesus Christ is the center of Christianity, His person. Remember chapter 1, the deity of Christ. Chapter 2, the humanity of Christ. His work, that is His perfect life. His death on the cross. God raising Him from the dead. His ascending into heaven. His lordship, His intercession for you. That, that's what a... That's what a Christian man or woman considers 
when you think about Jesus. I mean, later on uh, in the book of Hebrews, the preacher will, I mean, that's what he says, he uses the same word in Hebrews chapter 12. If you know any verses from Hebrews, you probably know Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, and it's the same word. This is what he says there. <clears throat> Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin which, which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. And here's that word, consider. It's the same word in Greek. To looking to Jesus or fixing our eyes on Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the, right hand of, at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider. John MacArthur, when he uh, was looking at this passage, you read his commentary, he uh, spent some time on the word consider. John MacArthur says that the word consider means to put your mind on Jesus and let it remain there that you might understand who He is and what He wills. And I really think this is one of the fundamental flaws in modern day Christianity is we don't actually spend enough time just meditating and thinking about who Christ is and what He has done. We want to run on from that to our problems and we look at Jesus through our problems. When the, the preacher here talking to people whose lives are, are in danger says, you need to return that around. And you need to consider all that you have through the lens of who Christ is, to consider Jesus. You know what this speaks to? This speaks to the sufficiency. Just write the word down, look it up. Sufficiency. The sufficiency of Christ, one of those doctrines that we need to get a hold of, that He, what this means is, is that He is able. This is what we believe about Jesus. That Jesus Christ is able. The old preachers used to say, won't he do it? What they meant was the sufficiency that he's able to do it. He's able to actually forgive. He's able to sustain. He's able to help. He's able to heal. He's able to bring marriages together. He's able to rebuild your life. He's able to strengthen you. He's able to bring you joy. He's able. And, and to help us consider this Jesus, here's what the preacher does in verse 1. He gives us just a couple of descriptors. Go back with me and look at them there. You see the descriptors of Jesus in verse 1? Let me read it to you again. <clears throat> Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus, here come the descriptors, the apostle and high priest of our confession. The apostle. Now, if you know anything about the New Testament, you think, wait, the apostles, weren't there 12 apostles and then Judas... That's the big A apostle. They have the office of being apostles. Yes, the word apostle actually means sent. But it is odd for us to hear it. It's odd in our ears. This is the only place in the book of Hebrews that the word apostle is used. This is the only place in the entire Bible that uh, Jesus is called an apostle. On the other hand, you take the book of Hebrews, the whole book. I mean, every page talks about Jesus as our, as our high priest. So put those two together. Let's, let's not separate them. Let's, let's keep them there the way the, the way the writer has. As our apostle, he is sent from God and sent to us. As our high priest, he is for us interceding with God. As our apostle, he speaks to us for God. As our high priest, he speaks for us to God. And, and the writer says... Here is Christ, the apostle. The word apostle means sent, to be a sent one. Isn't that what Jesus said? As the Father has sent me, told the disciples, I am sending you. Here is Jesus, the apostle. Here's the one who is sent as a, as a rescuing agent, sent from God the Father, God the Son, sent from God the Father to save us. Here is the high priest. That is Jesus giving himself as a substitute on the cross. Look, when, when Jesus is called the apostle, it reminds us that God the Father sent forth His Son Jesus on a mission. When Jesus is called the high priest, we are reminded that that mission is a sacrificial mission, dying in the place of sinners. 
So, to consider Jesus as the apostle and the high priest of our confession, it means to thoroughly ponder who he is, what he has done. It means that we, we weigh out his dignity, we dwell on his excellency, we submit to his authority, we behold him. I mean, this is what we're doing here. We behold him, we worship him, and we rest in him. He is the apostle and the high priest of our confession. But the preacher felt like that wasn't enough. Maybe, he didn't, maybe that wasn't enough for you. So it just keeps describing how we are to view Christ. I want you to think with me of Christ as the builder. You have here apostle, high priest. I just would put the word builder. Remember what, uh, what Jesus said to Peter about the church upon this rock? I will build, I will build my church. Keep that in mind as we, as we finish the, 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 the text. Let's go back into the Bible. Keep the word builder in mind. Let's go to it. <clears throat> Let me read it to you. Maybe just uh, add a little comment as we go. Let's start back in verse 1. Therefore, ho holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession, who was faithful to him who appointed him. Okay, Jesus was faithful to God. God appointed him. Jesus the Son lived on earth perfectly. Did that in our place. He was faithful to him who appointed him, just as, now here comes the Jewish flavor. Remember, he's talking to Jewish Christians, the temptations to fall back into Judaism. Just as Moses was also faithful in God's house. So right, Moses deserves respect, and he is a worthy man. But now here comes the elevation of Jesus. For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, here's the comparison, as much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. Okay, so, so Jesus is the actual builder. Moses is just part of the house. Now he does a little parenthetical statement. Verse 4 just kind of draws a parenthesis to give the proof for God's existence. This is, this is off argument, but it's good theology. Right there in verse 4. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. So when you go and look at a house, you see a house sitting there. Somebody had to do that. And so the logic, the preacher says, the same logic had to do with God. Look around you. God's the builder of everything. You see all of creation. It tells you that there is a God. And then he goes back to the argument in verse 5. Now Moses was faithful in all of God's house as a servant to testify. Here's Moses' job. He was telling, testifying to the things that would be spoken later. He's pointing to something. Here's what he's pointing to, verse 6. But Christ, see the comparison? Christ is faithful over God's house as a son, and we are his house. We hold fast. Keep looking. Verses 2, 3, from verse 3 down to verse 6. In, in just three verses, the preacher uses the word house six times. And he uses that word just to demonstrate how Jesus is superior to Moses. Moses is a part of the house. Jesus is the builder of the house. Verses 2 and 3, you see it there, right there in your Bible. Verses 2 and 3 tells us that Jesus is the builder of the house, and Moses is just, I mean, he's a good, a good part of the house, but he's just a part of the house. The preacher, even down to verse 5, come down to verse 5, even down to verse 5, he says, look, Moses is faithful. He's faithful in God's house as a servant, but Jesus is the son. And so what he's doing is the job of Moses, he had a job. The job of Moses was to point to Christ. This is the very thing Jesus told the scribes and the Pharisees. John chapter 5 Verse 39, to the scholars that knew the Torah, the law, written by Moses. This is what he said to them. You search the scriptures. In other words, you, you go and read Moses. You search the scriptures because you think that in them, in Moses, you have eternal life. And it is they, Moses, that bear witness about me. You understand that the entire Old Testament, we read that 
The entire Old Testament is one large arrow that is pointing to the coming Lord Jesus Christ. And according to verse 5, Moses' entire ministry, it existed to, testi to testify about the things to come, the typological patterns, the unique promises, the fulfilled prophecies. So all of that, let's put it down in one sentence. In Moses, we have a promise. In Jesus, we have the fulfillment. And it is, it is, it is vital. I mean, every sermon ought to be rich with Christ, pointing us back to Christ. It is vital for you as a Christian to think clearly about Jesus so that you can actually live joyfully for Him. That you aren't looking at Jesus through all the cloud of the junk of this world and your problems. Instead, your, your view is a Christ, it is a Christ-saturated view. So that no matter what you look at, there you have Christ as Lord over all. It is, it is vital for you as a Christian to think clearly about Jesus so that you can live joyfully for Him. He, he before I go to my second point, He is worthy of your unwavering attention. Think clearly about Jesus. There's something else to uh, notice in the text. We'll back up in verse 1, pick up the uh, adjectives there. Here's the second point, number 2. We need to think clearly about ourselves. Go back with me to verse 1. And um, we know that this paragraph, you can't say this about every part of Hebrews, we know this paragraph right here is addressed specifically to the Christians in the church. So if you're a Christian in this church, you need to listen right here. Look how he addresses them in verse 1. Let me read it to you. This is what he says. Therefore, holy brothers, that can be translated, holy brothers and sisters, therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, you consider Jesus. Let's take the phrases. You want to? Let's, uh, holy brothers that share in a heavenly calling. Let's take that first phrase, the descriptor of what it means to be a Christian. You, a holy brother or sister. Uh, let's break that down even further. What does it mean to be holy? When we say uh, that you are holy, does that mean that you walk around pious and never do anything wrong, that you are uh, like Mother Teresa? That is not what holy means means. That, that you are a holy brother or sister means that you have been cleansed of your sin by the death and resurrection of Christ. For instance, let me just give us the gospel right here. The gospel packaged up tells us that God is holy and created all of us in His image. You have dignity because you're created in the image of God. That image of God in you has been disfigured because of your own sin. That sin is so heinous it separates us from God. In fact, we're told we're dead in sin. But God, although being just, He must punish sin. He's also loving. He sends Jesus, the perfect man. Chapter 1 and chapter 2. And Jesus lives perfectly, fulfilling all of God's law, goes to the cross, and there at the cross, He takes the wrath, the punishment for sin, for humans, takes the, the wrath of God on the cross and gives righteousness. And the way that becomes real for you if you will repent of your sin and believe, the Bible teaches that by, by God's grace, giving us Christ through faith and what He's done, you then are saved and become a holy brother or sister. That means living by grace, living by grace and in the grace of God. So that you not only, it, it's sometimes popular for people to say, I know that I am a sinner saved by grace you also can be described as a saint. That you, you have, you, certainly you're still a sinner, but the overwhelming part of your identity is not sinner. That's been covered by the blood of Jesus. Your identity is a holy brother or sister. Holy. But let's take the other part of that word. Brother. Family. This is, I think, I think... This is one of the, the best felt things of the church that we don't spend enough time on, but we should really press toward, especially right now. Things, 
things outside of the church are becoming more and more volatile and hateful. And one of the great things about being in the church when you're in Christ is that you are part of a family. Listen, that means that you are accepted and supported and loved. It, it means that you actually have people. If you're a member of Hickory Grove, you have people. We are it. Congratulations for your people. I mean, you, you think about this church with, with so many things that might separate it, that actually separate us. We've got a myriad of things that make us different. We become united in Christ so that even though we are distinguished from one another by an, an infinite number of ways, we are bound together by the blood of Christ. I mean, we'll have the Lord's Supper here later in our service. We'll take the Lord's Supper. That's communion with God, communion with one another. We do that as a congregation, not individually. We do that together that reminds us that we are bound together by the blood of Jesus. I mean, look, here, here's the cure for racism. When we come together in Christ. He creates a new race, one new man in Jesus, a holy brother or sister. You know what that means for you? You've been, you've been cleansed. You're part of a family. You have security. You have responsibility for other brothers and sisters. I mean, we need to think clearly about who we are. Who am I? There's another descriptor there. Holy brothers. Um, the other descriptor in verse 1, who share in the heavenly calling. So the first part, holy brothers, had a lot to do with the relationships we have with one another. Sharing in the heavenly calling has a lot to do with how it is we are saved. This this understanding of a God-initiated work, that the call of God that saves us comes from God, that what God does when He saves us has genuine effect. Such effect, it used to be called the effectual call, that when God calls, something happens. You can see it pictured uh, in the resurrection of Lazarus. Jesus stands, calls to Lazarus, and it's the call, the powers and the voice that raises Lazarus from the dead. The same thing is said about our conversion. It reminds us, Jonathan Edwards says, that the only thing we bring to our salvation is the sin that makes it necessary. It's God doing it. This is a heavenly call. So when we start thinking about that, we're holy brothers, with a heavenly calling, you can think joyfully, you can think with confidence. Understand that hope and forgiveness is found in Christ. And, and when we rightly think of ourselves, we can see ourselves, see yourself as a recipient of God's good grace. I, I want to... I want to live my life joyfully. I know that you do as well. To do that, we have to think clearly. We need to think clearly about Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession. We need to think clearly about ourselves. We are holy brothers of a heavenly calling. But there's something else I'd like to just sort of <clears throat> set here for us. And this will be kind of my parting word. Number three, we, we need to think clearly about being a Christian. What does it actually mean if you are or are not a Christian? Like in this room today, we'll, when we take the Lord's Supper, those that are Christians on, on the inside, you take the Lord's Supper, it's a symbol that you're part. Those that don't, it, it is a reminder, a tangible, visible, seeable reminder. You're not. What, is this, what does this mean? You find it tacked on at the end of verse 6. Let me show it to you. At the end of verse 6. Christ is faithful over God's house as a son. Now he, now he ties it all up. And we are God's house. If indeed we hold fast our confidence... And our boasting and our hope. Hold fast. This little, this little challenge, uh, this little 
paragraph ends with a comfort and, and a challenge. The comfort is, hey, we are his house. That's what verse 6, that's what the preacher says. We're, we're in the house. We are part of his house. He's building his house. We are his house. But the challenge is, if we hold fast. Now this rattles, this rattles Baptist, as it should. Nowhere else in the Bible, read all of the, nowhere else in the Bible do we find these conditional sentences like we do in the book of Hebrews. That puts this immediacy to our faith. That reminds us that, that, that a believer in Jesus, she's a survivor. We certainly, we trust that we are saved by God's grace. We are securing that grace through faith in what Jesus has done for us and in the mercy that he gives us at the cross but all of that is actually seen in present perseverance. This is the very opposite of saying that you were baptized, you were saved years ago. I mean, it's so good to see Zach being baptized. I can give, I can give testimony to the guy who walks with the Lord. There, there's actual daily, I can see that testimony. This is the very opposite of, of being, saying that you were saved, being baptized, and trusting in that, and there actually not being any evidence whatsoever so that you are unconcerned by sin, unaffected by conviction, don't intend to actually be at church very often. <clears throat> Look, eternal security, which is a wonderful doctrine we hold dear, eternal security is so much more than once saved Always saved. Eternal security is once you're saved, obviously saved. I mean, the words at the, words at the end of verse 6 are joyful. As they go off into these problems, he says, we, you're God's house when you hold fast for the confidence and, and, and hope and the power of God to save you at the cross that you have enough grace that got you out of the jam you were in yesterday and once saved, always saved, is I'm looking forward to tomorrow knowing that there's going to be enough grace over there just as well. Amen. And when we start thinking clearly, we start living joyfully. So as I close today, I'll just put it before you. We just write out of the Bible. Are you thinking clearly about Jesus? Do you see him? as the only one that can save you. His perfect life, His death on the cross, His resurrection, His Lordship. Are you thinking right about yourselves? Do you see yourself as one that's been converted, you now holy, a saint, from being a sinner and a part of a body of believers, a holy brother or sister that, that is a recipient of this, of this heavenly calling? How about this? Do you, do, you, do you understand Christianity, that it's not something you, you're relying on something that happened years ago. You actually can give testimony to what God is doing right this moment. And after we sing today, we're going to sing, and then after we sing, we'll do one of those fundamental displays of what it means to be in Christ. I, I want you to be in Christ so that you can live your life joyfully, for the glory of God. Amen. Do you join me as we pray together? The heads bowed this morning as we go to the Lord in just a moment of prayer. We'll call this um, a, an invitation song. I'd like to invite you as, I, as we sing today, if there are any of you here that would like to talk further about what it means to give your life to Jesus, to, to go from being in sin to being in Christ, when we sing, if you'd like to come forward, our pastors are right down here. They're just going to sit on the front row. You come and talk to one of those gentlemen, and they would be glad to pray with you and talk further about what it means to give your life to Jesus. Father, thank you for the grace that you've given us in Christ. Thank you for the chance to come together. Thank you for holding us fast that we might hold fast. And I pray that you keep our eyes and the eyes of this church fixed on Jesus. In his name we pray, amen. Would you stand please as we sing together?